We are glad you're with us. As we plunge into a deeper than usually is possible discussion about our future here in South Louisiana. We're going to be talking about water, and water is literally all around us. But we're also going to be talking about community, and the seeds of that community is also with us here tonight as well. There were so many people involved in bringing tonight to fruition, making it possible. There was the New Orleans Healing Center that had the great idea. There was the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities that secured CARES funding through the National Endowment for the Humanities. Then there was the incredible creativity and vision of our speakers tonight, Jessica Dandridge and Rachel Sanderson. For everybody who helped make tonight happen, we're so very grateful. <laughs> My name is Amy Clip. I'm a 30-year resident of New Orleans, and I'm a writer by trade who helps people explain and share ideas about living in a complicated place like South Louisiana. But my main job tonight is to be a moderator, which mainly means that I'm going to be inviting you here in the live audience to join us. The speakers and I have so much respect for the lived experience you bring tonight and the deep thinking you've done about the issues that we're going to be talking about. But we are recording the session, so if you'd like to speak, just raise your hand and someone will make sure you have a microphone. We also want to treat you right as our guests, so please feel free to get up, enjoy the refreshments, the restrooms are right behind you through the gift shop. And if any of you have parked at Landry's, maybe nobody did. Nobody did. Good. All right. We're good. One quick word about what we'll be talking about tonight. We're going deep on the problems, of course, and there are many but we're also going to be talking about the possibilities. And for a discussion like that, we are in fantastic hands because Jessica and Rachel look so squarely in their work at the problems, but they leave so much room for the possibilities, for the partnerships, for the unexpected things that can happen when we come together. So, we will be looking at climate change and flooding. We will be talking about the problems of distorted thinking, racism, and poor planning that have created so much injustice in our communities. But we're also going to be talking about the possibilities because the two are linked, right? The problems and the possibilities. The problems are so big, in fact, we know we can't just tinker around with them, throw a little money at them. We have to, we are being pushed to change everything about what community means in South Louisiana, how we create it, how we nurture it, and how we get there. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to our speakers. They will introduce themselves and get us off and running. Strong. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jessica Dandridge. I'm the executive director of the Water Collaborative of Greater New Orleans. Um, I'm born and raised here. I'm a millennial. I've lived all over the city, the whole nine. Um, so I'm really happy that you all were here to make it. Please enjoy yourselves, enjoy the refreshments. Um, there's a restroom inside, so just wanted to put that out there. 
Um, so about me, um, I started as a youth organizer here in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Um, I um, saw a lot of the inequities and a lot of people around me didn't see the inequities and I wanted to do something about it. So I helped start an organization called Fire Youth Squad. I work with or, uh, organizations like Rethink and Vela, Puentes, JJPL, um, and I've stayed in the nonprofit sector ever since. Um, originally, I started in education and equity, working on school to prison pipelines, um, working with incarcerated teens, and then uh, took a bit of a break, tried to reevaluate my life. In that time, I went to Xavier University for political science and sociology, and then I went to the new school in New York City for international security and conflict. How do you go from international security to here? Um, so as I was near my graduation, I took an urban resiliency class, and I felt like the whole world opened up, right? Uh, they kept talking about New Orleans and how we were recovering after Hurricane Katrina and if we were recovering, and I was like, well, hold up. I have all the tea. I can answer all those questions. Um, and then I really fell in love with that work. After graduating, um, I worked for Rockefeller Foundation for two years, working in rural Alabama with black farmers, organizing them under the Rural Electric Cooperative uh, named Black Warrior. Um, and then I did a lot of consulting work independently with a lot of different organizations and working in nonprofit development and strategic planning. Um, so it came to me, actually I met Rachel in that process, so it's funny, we like, we meant to be friends, we're soul sisters. Um, I came to her when she worked at FFL for funding for education for youth, and she was one of the people on the board when she, at the Water Collaborative, and she helped to get me here in this role, and she's like a sister to me. So. With that said, I'm happy to be here and we're gonna have some really deep conversations. I really encourage all of you to um, participate, add your two cents. We wanna have lively conversations, so thank you. Hey everybody, um, first and foremost, thank you so much for being here. I know that uh, we're in the midst of still adapting to a global pandemic. I know that we uh, just a couple of days ago experienced a tornado in the, re in the area, as well as uh, many flash flood events over the past couple of weeks. And we know that you could be anywhere else um, well, maybe with an asterisk there because we're still in a pandemic, right? But uh, you chose to be here. Um, so just thank you so much. Um, it's a real privilege to be able to be here. So my name is Rachel Sanderson. Um, I am a person who is still trying to figure out what their role is within uh, water and my relationship with water and my relationship with thinking about climate change and how we adapt and how we think about the future strategically together because we cannot do this alone. Um, and so my background, um, I always like to lead with this. I am not from Louisiana. I make that very clear. I respect and honor the knowledge of every single person who has generational ties, who has lived here for generations, um, first and foremost. So where am I from? <laughs> A different river town. Uh, so if you follow the Mississippi River all the way up to the Missouri River, uh, there's Kansas City on the west side of Missouri, and I'm from a very small town uh, just northeast of that. So my family generationally has lived within about 10 to 15 miles of the Missouri River at that point in location. I come from a family of folks who are blue collar workers. Uh, my father is a millwright, so I don't know if he's listening, but hello, dad, if you are. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, farmers, butchers, things of that nature. Uh, whenever I was younger, there was a significant storm event uh, that came through uh, really close to where my grandmother lived. And so that was how I started to get interested initially in, in the weather and nature and thinking about um, really the relationship that we had to nature, which tornadoes are different than flooding, but regardless, it still requires people to show resilience in the face of disaster. So I think that was a moment in time where my fear of storms turned to fascination. I decided I wanted to be like Helen Hunt from Twister. That was what my dream was. <laughs> um, I ended up going to Mississippi State University to study professional meteorology. I did not become Helen Hunt. Um, <laughs> I, you know, dream not realized, but I'm really glad for that. Um, because at some point during my time at Mississippi State, I started to get really interested in coast and how the coast was changing, 
I didn't really know where that was taking me. I just knew that I was interested. Uh, so that's how I landed at University of New Orleans and got my master's in coastal geomorphology. Uh, I, whenever I was finishing my thesis, I started interning at the River Forecast Center in February of 2016. So that entity does all of the river forecasts for the entire lower Mississippi River Basin. So I was there for every single major flood event in 2016 and got to see a different perspective. Uh, from there, I actually uh, moved to Baton Rouge and lived with my sister for some time and moved there two weeks before the murder of Alton Sterling, about six weeks before the tw 2016 floods in August in Baton Rouge. Um, and that was a significant moment for me. I, I found myself uh, waiting to defend my thesis. I was gutting people's houses trying to figure out where we go from here, right? It, it was a moment where we realized that flooding in Louisiana was not just a New Orleans problem. It was not just a coastal problem. It was everybody's problem. And so that's how I ended up at Foundation for Louisiana. Uh, that's how I met Jessica. And yes, you are one of my soul sisters. Uh, fun fact, we do this all the time. So it's nice to be able to share the space with y'all um, and to have y'all be a part of the conversation. Um, I went to CPRA, worked on the Coastal Master Plan team for just a little bit, and now I'm actually the Region 7 Watershed Coordinator for the Watershed Initiative. Um, but I'm showing up wearing uh, my, myself, right? So I'm here as Rachel today. I'm here as the person who is curious, who is invested in figuring out what are the potential solutions to our problems. And so just much gratitude. Thank you for having me here today. Amazing women. So we're going to start opening things up and inviting you all to weigh in. But first, we're going to play you two clips that kind of bring it all home. The first is an excerpt from the documentary Locked by Danita and Patrick Jackson. And that's going to give a bird's eye view of what we're looking at here, where we've gone wrong. Nothing every person sitting here doesn't already know, but it's good to see it all put down in a capsule-like form. And then we're going to see a video that brings it to the personal, that moment where your house is flooded or flooding, and you're wondering, how bad is this going to get? What is happening? How can this be happening? It's a woman named Miriam filming her house in Denham Springs during the 2016 flood when 20 inches of rain fell in just three days. So let's watch these and then we'll hear from you. Right after the Industrial Canal had been built, you had a situation in which the Port of New Orleans were concerned that the rising water levels on the river could threaten the lock that had just been built. They were worried about maybe the top of the lock becoming overtopped by the river. The other thing is that it's purely the perception of risk from the flood in New Orleans. The idea was, well, we're gonna blow up the levee in St. Bernard Parish, we're gonna release some of that flood pressure, and that means that there won't be a run on the banks. It was also a way of inflicting a lot of suffering on folks, because in St. Bernard Parish, you have fur trapping, fishing, shrimping. A lot of those activities got disrupted in this, blowing up the levee and, and having the Mississippi River just totally spread out around the town of Carnarvon. Folks remember this. You don't go and blow up a levee in somebody's town and flood them out and have that not leave an imprint on the collective memory. The parish president down there famously said at the time as he watched this happen, you just watched the public execution of this parish. That kind of deep-seated skepticism really kind of coalesced and started to develop around the same time that the lock was built and around the time of the 1927 flood. Oh my god, this is just what we look up to. Oh my 
done. Yeah, clothes are washing. Unclip the dryer. Oh, what the? I don't even know why I'm gonna go with the dryer. Oh. Uh, well, uh, Jamie Love, you were right. Rachel, you were right. I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, I can't. There's nothing else I can save. There's nothing else to be saved. Hey, the bleach. The bleach is off today. Oh my god. The shed is underwater. Oh, I'm gonna get another table back there. Oh, ah. Okay, I'm knee deep. Welcome to the backyard. Oh man. Oh. Okay, now I'm side deep. Oh, the shed is a total bust. Oh, Jeff Beck. Shit. Oh, freak. Should I go unplug those things? I'm scared to get electrocuted. My office. Oh, my office. Oh, man. Oh. oh, man, my desk. My desk is almost under shit. I gotta get out of here. Let's go shut the lights off. The stereo's in the water. quick just from the time I walked out there now it's to my butt so the water is rising you've seen these clips you've lived some of these things what do you think we have to learn that we ha haven't learned quick enough That, okay, this is not changing. We have to do something to live with the water. Uh, because if you look at 1927 and now, we haven't learned the, the lesson that we have to live and manage water. Um, I think what has to happen, we have to claim back the coast away from the positive scheme of water protectors. I think the levee is a prison wall. It didn't work for Katrina. There's conspiracy that they blew the levee in Betsy in the Ninth Ward. You know, the most prone places are where the most disparaged people live, and that's by design. So until you remove the um, authority of the levy and the Ponzi scheme of taking the land away from them, the people and access to the water, we won't get anywhere. Because we're fighting with the foundation of the construct of race. And until you get to the root of it, until you call Lake Pontchartrain or Guata, and until you see Chittimachas and Choctaws and Chapatulas and Humas, until you get back to the source and you recognize that, until you right the wrong, everything you do will crumble. In the same week that children died at Seabrook, there's a report that the West End is getting redeveloped. When the East End never got developed, when Eastern got underdeveloped. So really, we can speak about it, but until you remove the land away from the people who are very, do not look at everyone the same. I mean, they have a police station at Leeson Field that separates the waters away from the black side of the lake 
and what we call the white side of the lake. In front of it is a bunch of trained beasts that crafted heaven. This is structural discrimination. We're redoing West End when the East never got done. So I live with that from then to today. So until we remove our power away from those people, we won't get anywhere. Rachel and Jessica want to weigh in here. Listen, listening to, I've seen these videos a million times because we, we pick them. Um, but for some reason, sitting out by the lake, I just started getting really emotional. Um, I got emotional because every single generation of my family has lived through that. My family lost their property in Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Camille, Hurricane Betsy, and the ancestors who I don't, do not know also lost land, they lost loved ones. And he mentioned in the video about generational trauma and collective memory. And that's what we're working from here in Louisiana. We're not working from a brand new slate. We're working from pain, we're working from distrust, we're working from the, uh, the ghosts, or not even, I'm sorry, not the ghosts, the reality, the big boogeyman known as racism, who operates with an invisible hand. I think your comment really spoke to me because we really, in the way we operate in New Orleans, and I think in Louisiana, and as well as the world, we think we can build ourselves out of injustice. Because of neoliberalism and our idea that if we build and build and build, and if we make a pretty building, that's somehow gonna solve racism or it's gonna solve flooding. And that's not true. Obviously with Katrina, the levees failed. And the, uh, and the Mr. Go, the, they were meant to fail. Every single one of these design factors will never solve our problems until we really look at ourselves. One of the things I learned in international security and conflict was the idea of reconciliation. We need that in Louisiana. I'm so happy President Biden came down to see what we're doing and he's like, oh, we have $100 million for infrastructure. Well, that's not gonna be a reconciliation process. Building our way out of injustice and systemic racism and poverty is not the way in which we can fix Louisiana. They built brand new levees, they built new buildings all over the city, but I don't see a change in the people. The same thing, I know we're not talking about the Claiborne overpass, but it's related. They talked about that. I had someone interview me recently and ask, how do I feel about that? I don't care if you tear down a, an interstate if nobody's being invested in. So it's the same thing with water. We cannot see ourselves out of this situation until we start seeing people as people, looking at their vulnerabilities, looking at their pain, looking at their collective trauma, and using that as a guide to move forward. There's no way we can continue to build ourselves out of that, and that's what that brought to me. And we have not done that. That was 1927, um, and then we have Mr. Go over 100 years. And the more we talk about this as climate activists or just activists in general, they're like, well, just another 10 years or another 20 years. Well, we've already been doing this for 100 years, and it hasn't worked. So what is the things that are holding us back? And I think that's what I struggle with every day. Yeah, and I, I also want to echo um, what Jessica had said earlier about being emotional in, in this space. Um, in particular, it's having watched those videos multiple times, um, found myself also getting teary-eyed. And then I think also the context of the two comments that we just received as well, I think, are really powerful and speak to that moment. And I think what Jessica is saying about how we've been operating and doing this work from a place of trauma, from a place of where we have built systems of injustice that have supported the oppression of people for the purpose of funding different things, whether that's a project, whether it's the government, whatever it might be, the reality is that whenever we are working from those systems of injustice, we are continuing to perpetuate that system of trauma. That trauma will exist as long as we have this system, as long as that system is upheld. And so I think one of the opportunities that we have with climate change is we sit, as we sit here in this beautiful location at the lake where surely we can see what the impacts 
of climate change look like firsthand. We know that the lake levels have changed over time. We know that flooding across the road happens often here. I'm told whenever the waves get high enough, they start to splash over the walls. But what does it actually look like for us to heal through our relationship as we think about how we really adapt to climate change, how we think about climate justice, how we rebuild community in ways that are not perpetuating the same systems that have created the trauma that we are forced to work with, which is creating these continued um, really developments and structures that we see that are sometimes necessary to be able to protect people, but at the same time, as the gentleman pointed out here earlier, that is not an equal investment that we have seen in many places. I think. Uh, whenever we think, whenever I think at least about the 2016 flood events, there are people who have still never fully recovered. There are people who have still fully, never fully recovered from Katrina. There are people still waiting to come home, right? And I think that's the opportunity for the conversation that we have to have. How are we rebuilding communities in ways that heal our collective trauma? Because it is collective, right? Even if you didn't flood, if your entire city floods, you got to find a new gr drug store, grocery store, you got to find a new bank. Your entire life changes based on that disaster recovery cycle. And so I think, again, the opportunity that we have is to be able to lean into our relationship with the land, with water, and really think about how we create systems that mimic those natural functions. Uh, it's no surprise to a New Orleanian, to somebody who lives along any part of the Mississippi, Missouri River, that the highest place is near the river, right? We all know that. There are things that are intuitive. There are things that we remember our, our elders telling us. There are things that are instilled in us that have come from our ancestors as we have thought about this challenge over time. And we know that all of those knowings, all of those things are inherently rooted in identifying and seeing each other as human beings and being able to move forward from that space to figure out how we do this together. I also want to emphasize education in New Orleans and in Louisiana. As you all may know, we are 50th, a good strong 5-0 in education. And that has a lot to do with how we manage our relationships interpersonal, our relationships with government, and our relationships with the ecology, with water, and so on. Growing up here, I, I saw the levees every day. I grew up in the seventh ward. My family lived in New Orleans East. And I saw the, I used to walk on the levee all the time when I was a young girl. My, my, my grandmother lived on Haynes Boulevard. So we would walk up and we walk a mile and we walk a mile. And I didn't even know what it was. They said it's a levee. And no one told me how it worked, what it was supposed to do. <laughs> it was just there, it was a grassy hill. And then Katrina had it. And I don't know people who remember who are locals, but they used to have houses on the other side of Haynes Boulevard. And I remember they, I came back and we visited her house and they were completely gone. There was nothing left but the stilts. And I had asked them, well, what happened? I was, I was 15 and 16 at the time. And I said, well, what happened? And they said, well, the, the water moved them away. I said, well, why they let them put a house on the water like that? No one can answer that question, <laughs> you know? And then we see the, the, the walls in Gentilly, right? And again, no one could explain to me what's going on with them, how they work. We didn't think of ourselves as a coastal city. We still don't. I talk to people all the time about, I have neighbors and friends that's like, I'm just gonna pull up my tree and pull up the grass because cement is just easier to maintain. And then two weeks later when it rains, they're like, well, what's wrong with the pumps? <laughs> We have to have a, a collective understanding of the economy and the ecology here in Louisiana on top of dealing with our trauma. We can't just deal with the trauma and say, well, you know what, we've solved it, which, you know, that may be my whole lifetime, but we solved racism, we solved poverty, we fixed it. That's just one part of the puzzle. It's also about education and all the things that we do in this industry and getting it out to the people who need it the most. When all too often I'm in a room with people who are like, well, I work in this field and they have all of the ideas, but the people who are most impacted are not in the room. They're not asked about what they're dealing with. 
And before you even go to them and say, well, we have money to fix it, listen. The trauma is the first step, and then educating them is the second step. Too often, people in government or people who are working in this field will say, well, we have all the solutions. Here's a giant coastal master plan, or here's an urban water plan. We're going to slap it on. This is what you're supposed to do. Figure it out. That's not going to solve anything because people have their blinders up. They have their pain that is controlling how they're going to respond and maintain and respond to um, information. And so I really want to also, I'm her, I was listening to you, Rachel, and in listening to the conversation, nothing's changed because we haven't changed our educational model here in Louisiana. We've had it the same, and I have not seen any change in how people are not only learning here, but they're also maintaining and carrying information. And the people who have all the information are leaving. I left, but I love my city. I love my state. I came back but most of my friends did not. They live in Houston, they live in Dallas, they live in Atlanta, they live in New York. They don't need that. No offense, I love all those places, let me be clear. But we need that information. We need young people to come back and, and relay that. So I just wanted to put that in there too. I think to just build on that as well, you know, we, there's a lot of data and information that shows that Louisiana is somewhat of, a, of what they call a brain drain. It's, we get folks who come here, they come and do, Amy and I were talking about this before, they come and do world-class research in Louisiana to the benefit of Louisiana, and they might stick around for a while, um, but eventually there's a moment in time whenever the opportunity outside of Louisiana is, is something that they can't turn down in some cases. And I think there's a real conversation that needs to be had about how we're retaining folks who are the experts because they live here, they are from here, generationally from here, who are the folks who should be leading that work, whether it's somebody who's working within government, whether it's somebody who's doing research, whether it's uh, somebody, I'm looking at somebody in the audience here who I know who is a big public health expert, right? I think being able to keep those folks here by investing in them means that we're also gonna have to change culturally and systemically in Louisiana what we're investing in because I think time and time again it becomes really evident that it's not people. So I think it's, you know, we, we see examples of this within the current House session or the current legislative session where there's been a bill introduced to make Louisiana a fossil fuel sanctuary. And the question that I have is at what cost? Because we know that those facilities are toxic and have been killing people for decades. So at what cost do we become a fossil fuel sanctuary? And when do we start to actually think about becoming a sanctuary for Louisianans, people who live here? And then I think within the conversation about folks who should be leading, leading the work, it's absolutely people who have been experiencing that, people who are on the front lines. Um, Any time that I see a, a process, um, and I've been guilty of in, in my, the beginning of my career, right, thinking that there's a, a, a I think a cultural uh, way of thinking where we think that the scientist or the economist or the person who's an economic developer inherently knows better. And I think we're going to have to combat that cultural narrative that we have in particular within Western civilization and society to be able to rethink that in general. I think there are folks who have been figuring out how to live with, with water for decades, and they know a lot more than anybody who's sitting in a, in, in a large office space who doesn't have the luxury of being able to leave their office often. So I think, <laughs> you know, it's it, it, just as much as it is in, in structural change, it's also rethinking the ways in which we have conversations about water and rethinking about what our place is with regards to those conversations, who is valued within that space? Um, who deserves to be able to have the mic? Because while I have it right now, <laughs> in, in most of the processes that I have the privilege of being a part of, 
I try to give it to somebody else who's been living here a lot longer than seven years, which is about how long I've been here. And so it's really, I think there's deep internal work about how we think about our trauma as it relates to water, how we think about how community relates to water, how government relates to water. Because especially after the video that we watched from 1927, there's, there's really a question, at least for me, about what is the opportunity that government systems and structures have and the folks who represent those have to be able to really heal a part of that relationship and recognize and understand that there are some good reasons why people don't necessarily trust the government, right? If the historical narrative that you've been told since you were a child from people who you trust is the government came in one day and blew the levees and ruined everything that I had, then I can understand why you wouldn't trust somebody who's in a government position. And so I think for folks who are working in government, how do we actually heal that relationship? How do we actually think about passing the mic, the literal mic and, and also the metaphorical one to folks who have been living on a day-to-day -day basis with the challenges that we're trying to actually solve. Let's look at it, another clip that kind of gets to what you're talking about. It's a news story that came out a year after the August 2017 floods that were exacerbated by a lack of preparation at the Sewage and Water Board. We're at Pump Station 6 in Old Metairie, which protects both Jefferson and the city of New Orleans. All the pumps inside this facility are working according to the city, but despite that, given last year's flooding almost one year ago, a lot of people tell us they get an uneasy feeling every time it rains. Inside pump station six, all 15 pumps are up and operational at full capacity. A far cry from last August 5th. That's when six of these massive decades old pumps failed. Across the board back in, in, in August of last year, uh, there were a number of uh, pump issues. There were a number of power issues. There you go. But one year later, the embattled sewage and water board showed us the inside of this facility, and they say... Many, many, many of those issues have been resolved. That comes after more than $80 million was spent for emergency repairs at this pump station and others across the city. In August of last year, 18 pumps went out. Out of 120 pumps in the city right now, only four are down. And while that's significant, if the city experienced another rain event like last August 5th. To be blunt, we'd still have challenges. I mean, when it rains, the system has a design capacity. Even the mayor, who says progress has been made, still has concerns about some areas. Even in mid-city. Uh, as it relates to the flooding on Broad Street in Orleans, uh, still very much concerned about that. And that's not exactly the news those who flooded last year want to hear. I definitely have some reservations. Oh, yeah. Jeff Barbarito owns Coral kind of Reef. Last out. August, the pump problems caused flooding at his business and many others in this Lakeview strip mall. It shouldn't be part of doing business in New Orleans, but it seems like that's something we've had to grow to accept. And the Sewage and Water Board also tells us that they have 77 more pump operators at facilities across the city than they did in August of 2017. So it, it shouldn't be this way. You know, you hear that a lot here in New Orleans, and yet there's a lot of money being spent for these technical systems. So. You all have heard the same news reports. You've waded through the same floodwaters that they're talking about. When you see this kind of news, what is it you want to change first? Yeah, um, I remember one of those floods, I wound up being on the news, and uh, I said, man, it looked like Venice out here. <laughs> but uh, 
maybe it should. Um, you know, Venice is living with the water. You know, maybe it should. Back in the days, natives had million mounds with these same clam shells that you get out the lake. And, and, and they're not really giving credit for the development of New Orleans, but when I was young, you know, with sort of shells in the driveway, like where they come from, in my history books, they never say they came from Lafitte Barataria Basin and all that kind of stuff. And we moved the natives off out the way and we just scavenged the ceremonial mounds and all that and paved the way. Nowadays, we call that uh, porous pavement, right? We have green infrastructure that the natives taught us back in the days, but we have to learn how to live with water. Maybe when New Orleans was developed, when Bullet and Lake Forest, the lowest point in the city, maybe not one house should have been developed on the slab. So why do you have urban development that you know fails? That's what I'm saying. Don't build houses on a slab if you know it's going to flood. Always have it elevated. Live in the trees. You cut the trees down and, and, and grow grass. And how many carbon footprints that causes? The trees protect us from the storm. They reduce the velocity of the wind. They give so much life. But we cut down all the trees and sell it through Bernard Marigny, lumber mills and all that, and rape the land. And now we're left with termites eating up the rotten forest. So, you know, we need to learn how to live with the land, like we said earlier, and learn from those lessons of the past. People were here living 60,000 years before the Europeans came for the last 700. It was developed before. It just not developed the right way anymore. Thank you. Well, I'll jump in, but I, I encourage people to step up and please interact with this conversation. The, so the guy said, we shouldn't be living like this. And I was like, shouldn't we? Because the problem is that, and I mentioned this earlier, is that we were not taught that we should be living with water. We thought we could pump the water away, sweep it away, brush it away, whatever, whatever way it could be. And people still think like that today. That's why there's so much anger around these pumps. I firstly want to also make a, set the scene here. Um, I remember the 2016 flood. I was actually were in Alabama, and I never forget one of my fellows from in Alabama had called me and said, Miss Jessica, there's six inches of water. We are stuck. Their car was in the I said, girl, what is you talking about? That's not, that can't be right. And I turned on the news, and that's exactly what it was. And every year since, we've had a major flood event just like that. And that is the new reality. Now, why is that that reality? New Orleans is meant to flood. We are a delta. Before they put the levees up in 1927, the waters of the Mississippi River came in. They let the sediment. Things grew. The indigenous thrived off the land. They knew when to move upriver and downriver based on the seasons. And then the levees came up. The thing about the levees and the way we pump is that, and to your point, I'm so glad you said it, is that we always, I say we when I say systems, thought we knew better than the people who are from that land. They can't know because of the way they look or the way they dress or the way they speak. And that is all boiled down to this concept, and I really want to keep honing in on this capitalistic, neoliberal concept of I am white, I'm not from here, I have all of these tools, so I must know better. But furthermore, I need to make money. Indigenous people aren't going to make me money. What's going to make me money is levies. The original levies before 1927, um, in the 19, uh, 1918s and early 1900s during the slavery days, the enslaved built levies. And every year the levies would fail. And every year they had to build a new one. And because of that, the levies, the whole 1927 system that we see today was pushed by slave owners, by plantation owners to maintain their land. They built the levees up along the Mississippi River so the economy could thrive. They could have their shipments of sugar and cotton and all kinds of products going in and out without indigenous people stopping their products from sale, or poor white people from stopping their products to go up the river to sale. It has always been about making money. 
It has always been about the oppression of people. So please don't think that the levees was just built to secure us. It was never built to secure us. It was built to secure money. Secondly, the reason why we have a culture here around the pumps is, again, to secure money. He was a business owner. And my family have, has businesses. And I understand the stress that is to own a business in any city, especially during COVID-19. But it's not, the, the, the pumps is just a way, it's a, it's, a, it's a false narrative to protect our economic good. It is really not protecting anyone because the cost that it, it takes is gonna go, I see Brian from, I'm, should I call you out? He's for sewage and water board. <laughs> but I wanna, I wanna quickly say about the pumps is that Federal investment in our infrastructure has dropped 77% since the New Deal. And so when people look at the degradation of our systems, our levees, our pumps, it's not because the staff at Sewage and Water Board doesn't care or because the mayor stole the money. There is no money. Utilities, infrastructure costs money. When the mayor did the fair share deal and they're like, well, she got $15 million, That's, we're done. I said $15 million is one street in the French Quarter. What do you, we don't have a concept of how much this costs. And so I really want people to understand that we need both gray and green in order to live with it. But the reality is that it's not that it's people, again, that trauma, it's not that Rachel is trying to get over me or the mayor or the, the director of sewage and water board, it's that our systems are broken and they were never built to, to benefit people or community or neighborhoods. They were built to invest into business, into money. Brian, I think he needs a, a mic. Hello, everybody. Please don't attack me. Yeah. Uh. Um, I think the conversation that you guys are having right now is really important uh, because one thing that I do as a planner with Sewage and Water Board is I do a lot of outreach and with that outreach um, a large proponent of it is discussing green infrastructure and just looking at how this conversation is structured and the idea of actually living with water uh, is something that should be really focused on that I don't think I know we hear it all the time but I don't think it's actually understood when people say what it means to live with water. Uh, another thing that Jessica mentioned was education is a really important part of this conversation that needs to be had as well on a number of levels. Um, coming from Sewage and Water Board and looking at it, I always tell people we can't pump our way out of a situation. It involves a, a larger scope in looking at things in general. And one way I try to describe how the pumps are gonna work is when we look at a rain event, if you compare that to if you have a large pot of water and you go to the sink and you just pour that large pot of water in the sink, it doesn't just disappear immediately. It takes a second for it to go away. So our pumps can only take so much water at a time. So we can use the green infrastructure as a way to aid our great infrastructure that's aging and may not be in the best shape, but we're working on improving it. But we also need another approach to that as well. So if Sewage and Water Board does one thing, you also have uh, the general public that may not have the education or knowledge to know in which ways they may be uh, pushing against us in some ways. And I can give, do you mind if I give an example of that? Okay, so one example of that is that uh, I try to teach people that catch basins are very important. Uh, when people clog and block catch basins, it, uh, it disrupts the water from getting to the pumps. So when they say that we can't pump the water out, we may not actually be getting the water because the catch basins are clogged, which is therefore causing localized flooding because that localized flooding is happening because there are trash and litter clogging those catch basins, which is therefore decreasing the amount of water going to the system to go to the pumps. Uh, and one thing that we do every year and that we're actually working on the grant for right now is looking at Mardi Gras. And when we have Mardi Gras, there are millions upon millions upon millions of beads that they pull out of those catch basins all the time. And so when you pull that out, 
you could just imagine like how much better the water actually flows and gets to the pump station. But it's a number of things that can go into that where people don't even realize that what they're doing. I passed by one day, a guy was cutting his grass and raking leaves. And instead of putting it in the bag, he was just shoveling it into the catch basin. Uh, and he didn't realize that th that was a bad thing. So in a way, he could blame water management on sewage and water board, but in a way he was also flooding his own property on one end. Uh, you mentioned people building up and instead of having uh, concrete, uh, it, a green infrastructure method is, you know, adding more grass, adding more trees, permeable pavement, porous pavement. Um, we had one guy say, hey, I don't like these trees, it's too much stuff in my yard, covered the complete yard in concrete, and was like, I don't know why I'm flooding now. And that was part of the reason. So he got rid of the natural resources that were actually taking in and like um, getting rid of and improving water quality, but also helping him with stormwater management. So I think education is a huge proponent of actually letting people know that sometimes what your, what your personal decisions are are actually affecting the picture as a whole. And although I'm not gonna say sewage and water is perfect because I know that we're not perfect, uh, but it, it, it is like a, a bigger scope whenever we look at everything all together. There's a lot of things that play into what people are doing. Another thing too, do not pour grease down your storm drain. It turns into a rock and it will clog and block not only that catch basin or the pipes around it, but like it affects everybody in that area and that will cause all of those people to flood and you would never know what the issue is until the flooding just gets too bad. So, and if you need me to come back up, just let me know. <laughs> Thank you so much for, um, I, I know you were like, don't yell at me, um, but really I think your perspective is necessary and I think it's a really good reminder for folks to separate the people from the problems because what Jessica was saying earlier is it's not um, it's not our friend over here who works at the sewage and water board. He's really trying to do work. It's it's something larger that's systemic. And then I think also something um, you had said, you said sewage and water board is not perfect. And, and I think if our expectation is perfection, then we're continuing to uphold the same systems and structures that we've been having conversations about here too, right? The expectation is to be able to have conversations and be able to act in ways that are values aligned and authentic to the things that we know that we need over time. Um, and I appreciated your story about folks who are um, perhaps doing things where had they had a little bit more information, they might have made a different decision. I, I think back to, I don't know, four or five weeks ago, one of my neighbors, our road had flooded. We got a, lane in Ra a lot of rain in April, as everybody here knows. Um, and so they called up the parish, and the parish came out and actually dug out the ditches that had silted in. And what we saw last week was that we actually had more flooding. And I haven't had the opportunity to talk to my neighbor yet and say exactly what happened, which is you've actually just created a highway situation where more water can flow faster to that particular point. So it's necessary to do a certain amount of maintenance, but then also at the same time, the strategy cannot simply be to get the water out as fast as possible. I think going back to the really thinking about a more holistic system, thinking about gray infrastructure, thinking about green infrastructure, thinking about the roles that each of us have, that our communities have. I know there are folks within this audience who all do really fantastic work on the ground already. So there's folks who are thinking about rain barrels because that's water that's not going into the system, into the pump system, right? You can actually use that for other things within your garden, for example. There are folks who are planting more water tolerant plants. There are folks who are actually having their, not having yards, they're letting it go back to nature and actually be a part of this ecosystem that is what nature is intended to do. 
And so I think whenever we think about these challenges too, again, looking back to nature is, is one of the greatest models and examples for us. We know that trees, for example, talk to each other beneath the surface through their roots and the fungi that they have, right? How do we replicate that? Those are really resilient systems. Like we look at the California redwoods and how they survived during multiple wildfires over time. Those are some of the oldest trees in this continent. It's incredible the amount of resiliency that can be built into a system if it just works the way that it is meant to work, the way that it was intended to from the authentic space of its connection and relationship internally rather than externally to these other factors that we've created within this capitalistic society that we've created through systems of race and class, right? So it's really how are we thinking about how we can be a little bit more like a forest? How can we be more like schools of fish? How can we be more like flocks of birds in the ways that we actually communicate, talk to, and live with one another? I just wanted to go back to uh, about uh, our infrastructure. And so the pumps have actually outlived the companies that manufactured them. And I, I always want to applaud the men and women who work in the pumps. They don't get enough respect for what it is they do for our city. And so I say thank you as it relates to living with uh, gray infrastructure, we know that the, the two, gray and green, have to marry in order to exist because it does work when, when those two are complementary to each other. Uh, and you mentioned the work that community organizations are doing and we're doing just that. However, the resources and the money go to the people who chase the money and not actually doing the work on the ground that affects all of us. And so when the gentleman was speaking about the man putting his grass clippings in the drain, we need to hold developers accountable as well who empty cement into the catch basins. And they just build that into the cost of construction. They're not really concerned about the flooding events that will occur after they've dumped cement or, and you can drive around any neighborhood, especially a community of color, and see that they're not practicing best industry standards. And so those are the people who need to be fined, penalized, and have punitive measures against their companies because they're not acting in the best interest of the public. And I sound like a drunk lady on this. That's good with a delay. If you guys do see that, call 52 Water. <laughs> we have a team of people that will go out that do environmental enforcement and they will technically go and they can give them a fine, have them clean that up, and we have a whole process set up for them. Oh, I got Take pictures and send it to us. I have a few people I should send to you because I, yeah, I saw, I saw someone dump a whole um, grill, all the coal, and they opened up the drain lid and dumped all the coal into the drain. And I know that neighborhood floods, so I have someone to send you away. Thank you, thank you. You can send it to me. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to back up what I'm hearing um, for gray and green, the hybrid. Um, so I live on Hagen, right next to, near Parkway Bakery. And it's been, uh, I wasn't, I didn't live there during the 2017 flood, but everyone lost their cars on that street. And it becomes a, it's a case study for um, 
canoeing, <laughs> you know, when it floods. And as Jessica said, it, um, every year there's been, a flood, there's been multiple floods that cause that street to just become a, basically a stream or a river that people enjoy with their boats. But the Sewage and Water Board and the city invested in the Hagen Lafitte Green Infrastructure Project and they installed um, rain gardens, bioswales on probably like one, about five, or s five to seven blocks on each corner and kind of um, adjacent to the sidewalk. And there has been a significant reduction in flooding on the street. Um, and it's, it's been, in, over the last four days of these storms, it's, we have not had um, cars flooding, <laughs> which is a great thing. So it's working. Um, it's slowing, the green infrastructure is slowing down the water before it enters the uh, gray infrastructure. So we're on, the, we're on a path of, of somewhere good. <laughs> this is so exciting to hear. I just want to make a final point. Thank you so much, Angela. She's walking off. Superhero, superwoman. Um, I just want to make a really final point about defining green. I think this is the last step, but people always say, oh, well, you need to live with water. Green infrastructure is wonderful, it's beautiful, it works. But I still feel people saying, well, we still need to mow the lawn so it's like this thick, <laughs> you know, or pull up all the weeds, and that's part of the process. We still haven't embraced Louisiana as it is. I had gone on many coastal Louisiana tours. I just did one at the Mardi Gras Pass, and it is stunning. It is beautiful to see Louisiana in its most natural state. And we have reorganized and redefined what urban looks like in Louisiana, and we need to get back to that. So even as we do green infrastructure and we're going to start to see more and more projects, I still hear people in New Orleans complaining, well, I, I like green infrastructure, but don't put the tree on this side of the street, put it over there. That's not how that works. It has to include everyone embracing this new life. It's a lifestyle change. It's a change in how we've done it for nearly 300 years, right? Part, part, most components of Louisiana history include gray infrastructure and pushing the water back, pushing the grass back, pushing the trees back, cutting them down for wood and, and, and income and, and money. And we're changing the way we look at our landscape. And so I just really want to make that final point is that defining what green in, is to you and your community members is part of the process. And having people accept that is really important. And, and just to build on that as well, I, I think a couple of folks had mentioned, why are we building house slab, houses slab on grade if we know it's going to flood? And the reality is that we didn't used to live that way, right? Um, I think that is, is something that is post-World War II boom. You know, what does the American dream look like for a singly family household where we have a slab on grade home with a white picket fence, the, the grass is this thick, we have some nice landscaping that's probably made of mostly invasive species, <laughs> right? And so it's really rethinking again what Jessica was saying, a, a new way of living, but it's not really necessarily a, loon, a new way of living, but I think it's really us getting back to our roots, back to doing the things that our ancestors used to do because they just knew that was how you had to live. Um, and so what does it actually look like to bring those roots back into our day-to-day -day lives and act on those in ways that actually also make us more resilient over time? Yeah, I just, we're rifting off each other and I, I love the topic of green infrastructure and I'm sad Angela left but right now, I'm working with the city and several people, and we'll be working with many more, and hopefully many of you in this room, on a stormwater fee. And the reason why that is important is because Sewage and Water Board obviously has a lot on their plate, lots of, lots of things to take care of, but that's not going to maintain green infrastructure. It's a wonderful thing. Green infrastructure reduces heat island effects. It reduces flooding. It increases economic opportunity, especially for people of color. It addresses redlining. It addresses mosquitoes. I mean, it literally does everything, but it doesn't do it on its own. 
and it requires investment from people. And so right now as we're doing this study, it's really important for us to put most of that in the green infrastructure. And I'm actually, I had a meeting with Gassan Corbin, the director, not long ago, and he's like, well, yeah, we're gonna get like 90% of the money. And I was like, er, no, <laughs> most of that money needs to go into green infrastructure. We need to divert funds from gray infrastructure, from pumps, and into green infrastructure. But also, and in, again, investing in the maintenance of it and investing in people. I really want to highlight the Office of Resilience and Sustainability, which is kind of like the office lost in City Hall and people kind of forget that it exists. But it is really important that that office is invested in. We as a city, we, people like Angela and people like Chuck Morse, who's not here, and Greenlight, and so many others who have been a part of this movement, their work is not being tracked. Uh, also architects and engineers who are doing these projects, their work is not being tracked. We as a city, I know, has invested millions, maybe close to a billion dollars in green infrastructure alone, on our own, without federal investment, and it's not being tracked. And if it's not being tracked, we won't get money, federal investment, private investment, to come back into to the work that we're doing. So it's really important that this work is funded. It's not gonna do it on its own. As I mentioned, 77% of the money that went into infrastructure, particularly the utilities and water management, has been reduced. And even right now, under Joe Biden's plan, when he's gonna put $100 million into water infrastructure, that does not actually mean that's gonna go directly back uh, into green infrastructure or, or uh, the data and research needed to know how it's working. To your point, you can see it, but it would be even better if somebody can give you a report and say, this year, all of these bioswales and planter boxes and uh, permeable paving collected this many millions of gallons of water. That would make you feel better. But it also will reduce your flood insurance because they know it's working. It'll reduce your cost of living. There's so much that would happen if we reinvest into it. So I, don't, I really want us to think about this as not like a pipe dream. I love green infrastructure. I will talk about it all day long. But it cannot do it on its own. We can't just say, well, put in a bioswill. Well, who's going to pay for it? We don't have the things that we need in this state to make this happen. So instead of being a, a haven for oil and gas, let's be a haven for green infrastructure, for climate adaptation, for climate mitigation, because that's the future of our state. There is no future left in oil. And I'm sorry for those who are on the call who may feel different, but I just came from St. John's Parish to visit friends, and every single one of those people in the community have lost someone in Cancer Alley, every single one. In fact, one lady lost nine family members. There's no future in that. We have to look into what New Orleans and Louisiana and Southeast Louisiana could look like, and in order to do that, we have to invest into it. And that is changing our mindset, moving our dollars into a different location, and then lastly, looking at our systems as a whole, looking at how indigenous and people of color and people who have been in this city and this state for generations, and looking back at how we did it, and returning back to that. And I think, you know, one final point on this particular topic of discussion for me is, um, as Jessica said, it's not a pipe dream. Uh, folks are looking to New Orleans, so the Louisiana Watershed Initiative, which is uh, actually funded with Community Development Block Grant mitigation funds, uh, specifically related to the floods of 2016, because I'm, I'm not sure if y'all know, but a significant amount of the parishes across the state actually had federally declared disasters because of flooding in 2016. It wasn't just Lafayette, it wasn't just the North Shore, it wasn't just Baton Rouge, it was statewide, really. And that effort in particular is thinking about, okay, how are we actually shifting 
uh, some of our systems in terms of evaluation criteria for projects to actually invest in nature-based solutions. How are we thinking about leveraging and lifting and supporting the fantastic work that has been done in places like New Orleans as well as other places across the state of Louisiana? Um, so it's not a pipe dream. That is here. It is here today. The federal government has been showing signs that they would like to invest. And I certainly think that now we have a transition in federal administration that they are going to be looking to further invest over time. Because I think one of the realities that's hard for Louisianans in particular to grapple with is over time we're going to continue to see this divestment uh, in federal resources that are responses to disaster and recovery. So we've really got to get ahead of that. But the Louisiana Watershed Initiative, um, it's $1.2 billion. So that's how much CDBG HUD, or HUD in particular believes in the state of Louisiana to drive forward a paradigm shift in the way that we think about flooding. They care enough to be able to invest that. And $1.2 billion is a drop in the bucket, but it's enough to get started as a state on having statewide conversations around how we're shifting how we think about water. And, and, and I think, you know, the conversation around living with water is one thing, but how do we actually find the water within ourselves and then relate back to that? Because that's it's the reality that we're living in too, right? So it's not a pipe dream, it's here today. And I think if we continue to invest in these different ways of thinking and education and green infrastructure in the way that we've been doing it, we're really stewards of this work and there are gonna be some significant opportunities for Louisiana to be able to benefit from that. It's not a pipe dream, it's happening, but there are really big forces pushing back. And how do we keep the energy going? How do we find it within ourselves? How do we create it within our communities? The work starts here. This work starts with us. What are our models for making that real? I, to respond to the models, um, I had the, the luxury of working with her last year for eight months on the Sacred Waters pilgrimage. And so for those who are not familiar, uh, she took a group, a small group of black, indigenous, and two-spirit women on seven stops on seven moons down the Mississippi River. When I was asked to join this pilgrimage, I thought we would be learning about indigenous culture and history, and it was way more than that. In order to see a future for our world, a climate resilient world, a water resilient world, we have to get back to the root. We have always thinking we can engineer or unengineer ourselves out of problems. We cannot. But what we can do is look within ourselves, look within our communities, and then look within indigenous history and culture. Look within African history and culture, wherever you're from, Italy, Spain, Norway, Greece, it doesn't matter. Looking back is how you move forward. And in West African, they call that Sankofa. Looking back to move forward. That's the future of our city and of our state. And it was, to bring it back to Colette, it was the most emotional experience I've ever had. Lots of highs, lots of lows, lots of lessons, lots of joys lots of singing, lots of dancing, and lots of tears. Because in order, all of us, including Colette, and she could attest to that, in order for us to get there, we had to shed our own trauma. We had, to, we had a collective trauma as black women and indigenous women that we didn't realize we even were carrying on our backs. And then we were asked to fight for everybody else. I am an ED, and anybody knows I'm probably pushing 70 hours a week, and I love what I do, and I would never change that for the world, but I'm carrying collective trauma. Every time I do the work that I do, I hear my ancestors in me telling me I live through this. When I look through old footage, when I read old reports about flooding, I see my great-grandmother, a Creole woman from Brobridge, Louisiana, and all the things that she lost. And I see my great-great-grandmother, Yamo, 
an Apache woman and all the things that she lost because she was moved from her family on the Trail of Tears. I have to look at all of that and that keeps me going. But I also should not be afraid to cry, should not be afraid to laugh, to feel what I need to feel. And all of the women on this pilgrimage were women who were powerful and smart. And smart. They had PhDs and masters and they didn't travel the world. And we all were sobbing like little girls because we didn't realize all the collective pain that we were carrying with us. And then on top of that, we thought the way forward is to carry that and that would be our fuel. That is not fuel. Fuel is really empathy. It is learning, it is openness, it is vulnerability. That's what keeps us going. So when you're thinking about what Colette is saying and this whole work that we're looking at in the future of New Orleans, it's about listening and being vulnerable. That's what it's really about. When we put up our walls and say, well, I know better than you because the model said, the model is not your soul. And that's why this shirt is so important. We didn't even shout out the shirt from Dirty Coast, thanks to Rachel. But our soul is waterproof. We've been drowning in pain and suffering and confusion and trauma from government, from our, our own systems, from racism, from sexism. We can go down all the isms list. It doesn't matter which the ism is, but what matters is how you move forward. And we can't do that until you look within. And I, I think it's, that's a hard act to follow, Jessica, to be honest. Um, <laughs> yeah, please, round of applause. Um, I felt that it was emotional and, and I think exactly, the question was what are the models that exist? And I think maybe the answer is that it's not an explicit model. I think that it is intuitive in the way that we know how to love, how to connect, how to be with each other, that is the model. We already know inherently how to do that. And I think what the, what the ask is here is really how do we emulate that within systems and processes or change systems and processes so that they can emulate that, so that it is authentic, so that it is led from the soul, from the spirit, from really what our ancestors have called us to do within this work. And I say called us to do within this work. I think everybody has that within them. And I don't know that necessarily work is the right word for it. I think it's it, they're calling us to be able to do things in, in the way that in nature intended, in the way that our communities used to operate, and, and, and how um, communal love and respect and uh, really authenticity used to be shared within those spaces. And, you know, I, I think we're getting to wrap up here. And so I, the, the last kind of things that come to mind for me is, um, for me, Louisiana is almost a place that presents the ultimate juxtaposition between the divine feminine and the divine masculine, right? And I think that's why people love Louisiana. They love the culture here. They love seeing how community has evolved over time through some of those models that Jessica was just talking about. Um, and then at the same time, I think we have this masculine uh, energy that is coming to the forefront. And I think sometimes that level of um, being direct and explicit is one of the good things about it. And then also on the other, the other hand of that, I think also it's, it's extraordinarily extractive. And so really rethinking the extractive models that we have, and I, I mean that more than just we're extracting from the earth, I mean what we extract from each other. Right? So a lot of the conversations we've been having about trauma and our conversations with one another, any time that you're entering into a conversation where you're not fully listening or hearing somebody because you don't want to, that's an extractive conversation. Um, and so how are we really thinking about shifting that? And I think we kind of get stuck between the giving and receiving nature between those two dichotomies or within that dichotomy and really we put them at odds with each other instead of cycling through in ways that are, that are good for us and cycling through in ways where we do cry um, like we used to when we were children, right? That release, that total um, giving away of yourself to the emotion that you're experiencing within the moment. And I think also within the context of the work, being able to experience joy and work that is so challenging 
It's something that we must do. It's something that is, that is healing for our souls to be able to experience that joy over time. And I think, you know, again, and Colette probably said this so much better than I ever could, but we can't do this alone. We have to do it together. And I'm not talking about just the people who are listening in today. I'm talking about the people who are um, hanging out on the lakefront here. I'm talking about the people that are in Landry's behind here. I'm talking about the people who are in Hammond, where I live, Baton Rouge, where my sister lives, Kansas City, Missouri, where my dad lives, and where all of my other friends and family, as well as people that I have never met directly, may have the opportunity to interact with indirectly across the nation and really across the globe. This is a global challenge challenge that we have to think about. And so the last thing that I kind of want to say here is getting back to the conversation around living with water and, and really thinking about how we live with water and then how we also see the water within ourselves and within our communities. I think in many ways we are like complex riverine systems. You know, we start at the headwaters and along the way we gather different things. So we gather connections, relationships, we braid together networks in ways that are so extraordinary and beautiful and actually create life. We know this. As soon as that river meets, meets the Gulf of Mexico at the Delta, it is one of the most complex and diverse and beautiful and bountiful ecosystems in the world. And it is such a privilege that in Louisiana we get to have that ecosystem here. And so really, what are the ways through this work and through ourselves can we emulate being more like a river? <laughs> Collecting and carrying the resources and braiding the networks that we have along with us as we go downstream to where we meet the Gulf, to where we actually grow what is this fantastical and very real future where we can all lean on one another and support one another and do this work together. And so it's really, I think, back to what Colette had said is, is how do we use this as a moment and opportunity for us to liberate ourselves instead of continuing to shackle, shackle ourselves in the ways that we have Bluetooth before. Preparing. Thank you, Bluetooth. <laughs> Bluetooth was like, so are y'all done? Um, we're, we're almost done. We're like two feet from done, one inch. I just, so it's so funny. You said that about the headwaters, and I wanted to just end on this note and hand it over to Amy, that at every stop, all those seven stops, we stop first in Minnesota. And when I say that it, water work is spiritual work, you cannot think of climate work or climate adaptation in a vacuum. And some people do, but I don't know how they do it. Because it is really you believing that the earth is the solution. And if you think the earth is the solution, if you think grass is a solution, if you think trees and shrubs and flowers and plants and the bees and the birds and, and bears and all of that is a solution, then you have a spiritual relationship with the earth itself. And so it is rooted in that. And so when we came to the headwaters, we didn't know that that was going to be Juneteenth. This trip was planned a, six months in advance. And when Juneteenth happened, we didn't anticipate George Floyd being murdered by the police. And yet we were there in Minnesota, St. Paul, on Juneteenth doing a water ceremony. We were not there, and, and Colette was clear, we are not engaging in protests. We are here for the water. And we were kind of like, oh, I'm so disappointed. I really want to go out to the protests. And it, we found this place called Raspberry Island. And it was surrounded by city, St. Paul. And it's a natural island, one of the few left on the Mississippi River. And I couldn't believe how beautiful that water was. It was so clear, because I've lived in Louisiana my whole life. As you know, it's not the prettiest. But that water was so clear. And the air was so crisp. And they did an entire water ceremony, the Wind and Warrior and, and uh, GCCLP, and it was just 10 of us in the middle of a pandemic, and all around us you see people honking horns about George Floyd and Juneteenth and Black Lives Matter, and we were here for the water. And at first we were disappointed, and then after a four-hour ceremony where we were releasing and facing our fears and listening and singing, we realized that's what we need. 
a lot of people run off to protest and they run off to, to go and fix, and I understand the desire to want to make change. But first, you have to look within. And thinking about that ceremony, one of the Win and Warrior, the Nana said, is that all of this energy that we brought to the river will follow us seven months later at Fort Jackson in Louisiana. And it did. The energy from that space did. And at every stop, we thought about the stops before it, in Iowa and Cedar Rapids, in Cairo, Illinois. We thought about the collective pain that came from the headwaters, from indigenous communities and black communities that were uprooted or hurt or traumatized. We thought about the farmers on the Mississippi River, corn farmers and soy farmers. And then we thought about the, the culture. We were in Memphis and we were in Tunica, Mississippi. And to end in New Orleans, it is a special place to be because all of that pain, but also all of the beauty of all of those cities up and down the Mississippi River ends here. And we are so integral to the spiritual relationship with water. So I want us to leave here thinking, as we hear the, the, the lake behind us, that it's not just about systems and structures and money. It is about your relationship with the earth. And if you can understand that and accept it, then you can see a different world. You both took us deep. You both are gonna help us be there for the water, and with the water, with ourselves. Thank you so much, Jessica and Richelle. And thank you everyone who was with us tonight. It was a good moment for hearts, for bodies, for people together. Good night.